My name is Helen Talley McCray, and I work in the One Health Office of the National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. On behalf of the One Health Office, I'm pleased to welcome you to the monthly Zoonoses and One Health Updates call on April 3rd, 2019. Zoho call content is directed to epidemiologists, laboratorians, scientists, physicians, nurses, veterinarians, animal health officials, and other public health professionals at the federal, state, and local levels. Please be aware that CDC has no control over who participates on this conference call. Therefore, please exercise discretion on sensitive content and material as confidentiality during these calls cannot be guaranteed. Today's call is being recorded, so if you have any objections, you may disconnect. Detailed instructions for obtaining free continuing education are available on our website and will be given at the end of this call. These presentations will not include any discussion of the unlabeled use of a product or a product under investigational use. The planning committee reviewed content to ensure there's no bias. CDC did not accept commercial support for this activity. CDC, our planners, presenters, and their spouses or partners disclose they have no financial interest or other relationship with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services, or commercial supporters. Before we begin today's presentations, Dr. Rhea Guy, One Health Office Research Fellow, will share some One Health, updates, One Health news updates with you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for today's Zohu Call, and welcome to all of our new participants. We appreciate you all for helping us spread the word about the Zohu Call and letting your colleagues know that we offer free continuing education for live calls and web on-demand recordings available on our website. The Zohu Call audience is now a whopping 12,800 subscribers representing professionals from government, non-governmental organizations, industry, and academia, as well as students. Please continue to share the links to the Zohu Call website which includes information on free continuing education for a variety of professions, and a link to subscribe to the Zohu Call email list. To begin today's call, I'd like to share highlights on the latest One Health news and resources with you. These links and others are included in today's Zohu Call email reminder. Some new resources that are available include updated CATS web content on CDC's Healthy Pets, Healthy People website, a new digital education platform from AVMA, a new aquatic animals web portal from the World Organization for Animal Health, or OIE, and a new WHO FAO OIE tripartite guide document called Taking a Multisectoral One Health Approach to Address Zoonotic Diseases in Countries. And this was developed in consultation with CDC as well as many other partners. Some upcoming events of interest include National Public Health Week, which is this week, and National Dog Bite Prevention Week, which is next week, April 7th to 13th. We've also shared some recent publications, including relevant updates from MMWR. These include diagnostic methods used to classify confirmed and probable cases of spotted fever rickettsiosis in the United States, 2010 to 2015, and notes from the field about an investigation of Colorado tick fever virus uh, disease cases in Oregon in 2018. A new outbreak notice has also been released on salmonella infections linked to Butterball brand ground turkey. And updates have been made to the outbreaks of sal salmonella infections linked to ground beef and to pet hedgehogs. As always, a selected list of ongoing and past U.S. outbreaks of zoonotic diseases, as well as information on staying safe and healthy around animals is available on CDC's Healthy Pets, Healthy People website. A complete CDC current outbreak list is available at cdc.gov forward slash outbreak. If you would like for us to share news from your organization, or if you want to suggest presentation topics or volunteer to present, please contact us at Zohu Call at cdc.gov. Thank you for your support of the Zohu Call and for joining us today. I'll now turn the call back over to Helen. Thank you, Dr. Guy. Today's presentations will address one or more of the following objectives. 
Describe two key points from each presentation. Describe how a multi-sectoral One Health approach can be applied to the presentation topics. Identify an implication for animal and human health. Identify a One Health approach strategy for prevention, detection, or response to public health threats. Identify two new resources from CDC partners. Questions for all presenters will be taken at the end of this call. Please call 1-800-800-593-8936 and enter participant passcode 9611836. Press star 1 and give the operator your name and affiliation. Please name the presenter or topic at the beginning of each question. You'll find resources and links for all presentations on our website and in today's Zohu call reminder email. Our first presentation, Chicken Liver Associated Campylobacteriosis and Salmonellaosis, Learning from Outbreaks to Develop Prevention Strategies, will be given by Commander William A. Lanier. Please begin when you're ready. Thanks, Helen. Hi, everybody. This is Willie Lanier. Um, I am a U.S. Public Health Service veterinary officer assigned to USDA Food Safety and Inspection Service, or FSIS. And uh, Helen gave the, the name of my talk. I just want to emphasize these are human infections of Campylobacteriosis and Salmonellosis. Um, first, I'll tell, tell you about the outbreaks that have been occurring and then what we've done about them and tell you some of the things that still need to be done. After the presentation, I look forward to questions if there's time, but in case there's not, I included my email address here. Please feel free to contact me. Also, before I get into the presentation, I want to acknowledge the many people who have collaborated on this issue in numerous agencies and groups, including local, state, federal agencies, and academic institutions. Okay, the next slide. So chicken livers have gained notoriety in public health and food safety circles in recent years. This is a sampler of online publications about outbreaks and illnesses. We started noticing outbreaks a few years back, and we decided to dig a little deeper into the outbreak data to try to figure out what was going on. On to the next slide. So we conducted a review of reported chicken liver associated outbreaks during 2000 through 2016 in the United States using data from FSIS, the CDC's National Outbreak Reporting System, or NORS, published reports, and state and local agencies. Shown here is a graph of the outbreaks identified in the study with year on the x-axis and number of outbreaks on the y-axis. 28 outbreaks were identified, which is a lot of outbreaks, especially for a product that is not consumed all that commonly. 23 of these outbreaks were Campylobacter, shown in blue here. Three were Salmonella, shown in red. And two were actually both of the pathogens, shown in green. There was a marked and concerning increase in outbreaks during the later years of the study. There were 361 total reported illnesses and among case patients with available information, 51% uh, were women and 63% were at least 20 years of age. Okay, on to the next slide. <clears throat> this map shows the geographic clustering of the 28 outbreaks included in the study by state of case patient residence. Most outbreaks were single state, but there were four multi-state outbreaks. Outbreaks were clustered in the Northeast, West, and Upper Midwest. So we found that many of the outbreaks had three key factors in common. Of the 28 outbreaks, 24 or 86% featured chicken liver pate or a similar blended dish. In 26 or 93%, the chicken liver dish was inadequately cooked. And in 25 or 89 percent, the dish was prepared in a restaurant or other food service setting. These are key points that one might want to keep in mind if they were, say, taking a continuing education quiz later. OK, on to the next slide. <clears throat> the outbreak review went through 2016. We haven't done that kind of formal outbreak re 
review for more recent years. However, we do know that the outbreaks have continued. For 2017, FSIS is aware of four potential outbreaks. And for 2018, FSIS is aware of three potential outbreaks. There may very well have been additional outbreaks in 2017 and 2018 beyond what FSIS became aware of. Some outbreaks may have been reported to NORS and not to FSIS. To put this in historical context, for 2015, FSIS heard of one outbreak, and we learned that there were actually nine total reported outbreaks after we looked in NORS. And for 2016, FSIS heard of two outbreaks, and we discovered that there were at least five reported outbreaks total after we looked in NORS. Keep in mind that some outbreaks may not be detected or reported at all. Moreover, outbreaks represent only a, frac a small fraction of the total illness burden. Most foodborne illnesses are sporadic, meaning not associated with a recognized outbreak. So there's a real potential for a tip of the iceberg phenomenon here. OK, next slide. So we, we've got a lot of outbreaks linked to chicken liver. Why? One interesting thing about chicken liver is that Campylobacter and potentially other pathogens exist inside the liver. So not just on the surface, but actually in the internal t liver tissue. <clears throat> this is important because partial cooking perhaps just searing the outside, will not kill the pathogens in the middle. Despite this, recipes calling for undercooking of, of chicken liver are common, advocating for things like leave it rosy pink in the middle. Palatability concerns may lead to undercooking. There's a fear out there that if you overcook liver, or maybe even if you just fully cook liver, the look, texture, and taste won't be right. So here's a scary equation. The internal bacteria that I just discussed plus the undercooking that is occurring equals a real recipe for illness. It's no wonder that so many of the outbreaks included undercooking as a contributing factor. <clears throat> so this next slide, I'm going to skim over this slide for sake of time, but suffice it to say that Chicken livers are also often contaminated with Campylobacter and Salmonella on the external surface. About three quarters of them contaminated by Campylobacter and about two thirds by Salmonella, according to FSIS testing. So we'll move on to the next slide. So we've learned quite a bit about chicken liver contamination and outbreaks. <clears throat> chicken livers are contaminated both externally and internally with pathogens. And the typical outbreak involves chicken liver pate that was undercooked in a restaurant. This gives us some very specific illness prevention targets that we've focused on to create a number of resources. We've collected these resources into a one-stop shop web page for sharing with industry representatives, public health partners, consumers, researchers, and other stakeholders. The handy short URL for this page is shown here. I'll discuss a couple of these resources. Focusing on the food service industry, we created an infographic for chefs, cooks, and caterers to encourage them to safely cook chicken liver dishes. We also created a guideline document for establishments that produce chicken liver with science-based interventions to mitigate hazards. One key prevention message is cook chicken liver to a safe minimum internal temperature of 165 degrees Fahrenheit. OK, the next slide here is a screenshot of the top part of the chicken liver resource web page that I mentioned. On the page are listed several resources aimed at preventing illness associated with chicken liver, some of which will be included, I believe, in the materials for this webinar that will be shared later. And on to the next slide. Here is the chicken liver infographic for chefs, cooks, and caterers. This is a collaborative effort between CDC and FSIS, as well as many other partners. We are trying to get this infographic into the hands of chefs through industry groups, public health and food safety associations, local and state environmental health investigators, and other partners. The main message that appears a few times in this infographic is to cook chicken liver to 165. If you 
on this webinar have a role in restaurant food safety, I invite you to use and distribute this resource. Okay, next slide is, is my last one. Finally, uh, there are several next steps we would like to take regarding chicken liver. First, we need to get the word out about the resources that we have created. One of our next goals <clears throat> is to encourage the development of cooking methods that are safe, meaning that they kill pathogens, that are accepted by chefs, meaning that they are feasible in a restaurant kitchen setting, and also accepted by consumers, meaning that they produce palatable dishes. I'm basically talking about a validated pate recipe, perhaps something that involves high pressure or low te lower temperature and longer time. We would like to collaborate with researchers and chefs on this. Next, we plan to promote continued research into effective interventions that reduce pathogen load in chicken livers or otherwise mitigate hazards. There's been great work done by researchers on this issue, and we'd like to see that continue. We also want to incorporate these interventions into the FSIS guidance that we've created for industry. We know that freezing, organic acid wash, and labeling can help. Other interventions that may show promise include irradiation and high pressure processing. So that's it for my presentation. But I want to leave you with an invitation to collaborate with us on this issue. So if you have an idea about developing a cooking method or interventions, or know of a chicken liver associated outbreak, or can help get the word out about resources, or would simply like to learn more, please contact me. Again, I'd like to express gratitude to all the partners who have been collaborating with us to help prevent illness associated with chicken liver, and also to the CDC Zohu team for the opportunity to present to you today. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Our next presentation, Q Fever in Colorado, Collaborative One Health Response, will be given by Dr. Maggie Baldwin and Dr. Jennifer House. Please begin when you're ready. Thank you, Helen. Um, this is Maggie Baldwin. I'm a veterinarian and the Animal Incident Management Specialist at the Colorado State Veterinarian's Office. And I'm joined with um, Dr. Jennifer House. Dr. House, are you there? Yes, I'm here, and I'm the State Public Health Veterinarian of Colorado. Wonderful. So we're going to give you kind of an overview of um, what we've been doing in the past year for Q fever response in Colorado. Um, since this is a wide variety of participants on the call, we thought we'd first start with a brief overview of um, the organism itself and Q fever and coxiolosis. So the organism is um, an obligate intracellular gram-negative proteobacteria that's highly stable and resistant in the environment. Um, it's resistant to disinfectants, UV light, heat, cold and desiccation. Um, the current grade A um, pasteurization standards are set to kill Coxiella because it's one of the, the hardiest bacteria that we um, try to prevent in milk. Um, currently, um, goats, sheep, and cattle um, shed Coxiella and birth products um, in milk, urine, and feces. Those are kind of the three big livestock species that we worry about with Coxiella. And um, 10 to the 9 bacteria are shed per gram of placenta. So it's a high um, bacterial load. A little bit on epidemiology. Coxiella is found worldwide, um, except it has not been reported in New Zealand. And some of the reservoirs for Coxiella in domestic animals is sheep, goats, um, cattle, dogs, and cats. Um, Non-domestic species include birds, reptiles, and wildlife. Coxiel is a known occupational hazard for farmers, um, livestock producers, veterinarians, and those that work in um, production systems like slaughterhouses. And it is also a Category B bioterrorism agent due to um, its highly uh, infectious nature and the fact that it can be spread aerosol, um, through aerosol and that it's resistant to um, a lot of ways that we normally kill pathogens. Um, so Coxiella bacteria can cause human disease, and that human disease is known as Q fever. The incubation period for people is approximately two to three weeks, but maybe as long as five weeks. Um, it is estimated that approximately half or maybe up to 60% of people who get infected with the bacteria do not develop any symptoms or they have subclinical illness. 
Um, a, uh, the, the remainder will have acute disease. Acute disease is characterized by a nonspecific febrile illness. Um, and unfortunately, about 5% of infected people um, will possibly go on to develop a chronic in disease which or is um, actually persistent infection, so they are not clearing it. Um, in that 5%, it includes both people who were symptomatic and asymptomatic people. Um, and the chronic infection or the symptoms may develop months to years after the initial exposure. Um, diagnosis can be done through PCR at the exact right time, but more, more cases are actually diagnosed through antibody testing on serum. Most cases will recover without any treatment, but in the event an individual does need to be treated, doxycycline antibiotic is considered to be effective. So animal disease is known as coxiolosis, and again, sheep, cattle, and goats are, are typically um, asymptomatic carriers. Uh, however, when they demonstrate clinical disease, it usually prevents those adverse pregnancy events which includes abortions, stillbirth, um, or even retained placentas and weak newborns. Um, to diagnose uh, coxiolosis in animals, because it's a ubiquitous organism and they're not always showing um, cl clinical disease, the, the diagnostics can be tricky. However, PCR is available um, and um, different types of serology like IFA, ELISA um, are available as well. Uh, treatment is controversial. Um, there's, there's no evidence to show that treating animals will change the outcome of events, but um, some feel better treating <laughs> versus doing nothing in the event of an abortion storm. Um, there's also currently no vaccinations available for Coxiella. The prevalence of Coxiella is largely unknown at this time. I mean, it's a, a ubiquitous organism, um, but there are some national studies that have been done in dairies that suggest it's anywhere from 75 to 95 percent. And so we're going to go over a little bit of Q fever in Colorado. Okay, this slide um, represents our case count um, um, going back to 1996. Um, Colorado, um, uh, you can see that almost every county has had a, at least one case within the past 20 years, or at least one diagnosed case. This is a very under-diagnosed um, infection. Um, and for the colors, um, some counties have only had one case, um, but the darkest county has 22 in that time frame, um, so almost one case per year. Um, our average, at least um, from the five-year period 2012 to 2016, were, were five acute cases, and this is acute fever in humans, and one chronic case. So we do um, see it um, not all the time, but regular um, enough. Um, in 2017, we would have considered that a normal year with um, six acute cases and no chronics, and almost all of those cases were associated with um, bursting animals. Um, and then periodically we do um, see maybe roughly one case per year that we would consider a background case that where we aren't able to find a definitive source of where the individual got it. Um, in 2018 we had um, a, a little bit higher. We had eight acute cases and unfortunately two of those individuals were veterinarians. So we're going to give an overview of the 2018 investigations, which kind of kicked off our joint collaboration work um, that we've done together. So in February of 2018, we had a dairy that was, um, it's a mixed dairy. It had goats, sheep, um, cattle, and yak. And the way that this case started was an abortion storm in the goat herd. Um, the initial diagnostics that were done did not come up with Q fever because, or Coxiella because they, they were not testing for that at the time. Um, and then subsequent cases um, at the Veterinary Diagnostic Lab at Colorado State University, they did end up testing for Coxiella and it was positive. So um, this was a, a very large and complex case that we had. It, um, the premises itself was um, 
I don't remember exactly how many number how many animals they house, um, but it was a, a menagerie as we would call it. Um, they actually had raw milk shares, which is legal in Colorado. It's it's not regulated by anybody, um, but they had raw milk shares that they were sharing to individuals in four counties. And Dr. House is going to talk a little bit about how those worked with public health. Um, so this this big investigation really did start our, our joint work. Um, Dr. House, do you want to talk a little bit about the raw milk shares? Yes. Um, so the investigation did start out with um, the Colorado Department of Agriculture looking into this positive lab report. And they discovered that this farm was a, a registered dairy that produced cheese. Um, um, and they also participated in raw milk shares, which is legal in Colorado. Um, they did um, distribute um, to shareholders within four counties in Colorado. Um, so we were able to obtain the, um, a, a list of shareholders, and we sent an initial letter to let them know that a goat had tested positive for this, and then to explain what the disease was and symptoms to look for in at-risk populations. At the time of the first letter, none of the goats were in milk. Um, they, had a, they, they were obviously having abortions, so they had not made it into the milking parlor yet. They were milking cattle at that time. Um, and then there um, was testing of um, raw milk um, from the cows that did test positive. So a second letter was sent to shareholders to let them know that the milk from the cows had also tested positive. But the first letter did warn them that that was a possibility. Um, we did um, invite them to participate in a survey so we could um, um, basically follow up on them. Um, we discovered that at least 20 pe 21 people admitted to um, consuming raw milk from this farm. Um, uh, and we followed several people and tested several people. We did not have any individuals that tested positive for Q fever and that only had exposure to the milk. We did have two human cases associated with this farm, and both of those individuals had direct contact with animals and um, products of abortion. Perfect. So um, because of this, this initial case, um, CDA is Colorado Department of Agriculture, CDPG is the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. We really did start some great collaboration, and we also included um, local public health as well at the, co the county level. So with this initial investigation, we had our initial and, um, and then subsequent weekly conference calls, so we all knew where we were at. Um, when we had a site visit, to the premises, we had state and local public health join our um, field veterinarian on the site visit so they could also see the operation. Um, we also developed a joint epidemiology investigation form, which our field veterinarians use now when they go out to um, any sort of Q fever or coxiella case. Um, they use a joint epi investigation form, which has questions from both the animal side and the human health side. As far as information sharing, we, um, our state platform is Google, so it was very easy for us on both the CDA and CDPHE side. We had um, shared Google folders that we would um, put all of our diagnostic information um, as well as our herd management plans. So we would develop site-specific herd management plans that would address both animal and human health concerns. And I'm going to get into that on the next slide, but another result of this first case was that our CSU Veterinary Diagnostic Lab did add Coxiella to their abortion screening panel, um, so sub subsequently we did receive a lot more positives. Um, as far as our herd management plan, um, the way that we develop these is essentially best management practices to protect both animal and human health. And those include um, biosecurity procedures on a routine basis, as well as if animals are calving or kidding or lambing. Um, and making sure that people keep accurate animal inventory and records. So in case we do get a, a positive coxiella, um, we can see where that animal came from or potentially if it you know, had gone to a show at some point in time. Um, it's important to know what those animal movements are so we can trace anything and, and see if there are any connections in these cases. And they also had reporting requirements. So if any of the animals, when they were under a herd management plan, had an adverse pregnancy event, they had to report that to our office, and then subsequent diagnostics were performed on those. 
Um, surveillance and testing was basically if they did have adverse pregnancy events, um, we would have them collect them and send them to the diagnostic laboratory. And then education, and that really fell into place if um, some of these cases were show goats um, or show animals and then in dairies as well. And then Dr. House, do you want to just add um, what you guys put in there for public health and herd management plans? Um, so our local um, public health agencies, um, we, we let them know that these investigations are going on. Um, uh, several of them actually started with an animal disease investigation. So we let the local health departments know what's going on, and they have materials. They will contact the family that owns or cares for the animals and explain to them what the condition is, the symptoms they need to look for, and recommend that high-risk individuals um, not um, have any uh, direct contact or um, specifically not assist with the birthing um, of these animals. Perfect. Um, so our last um, couple slides that we're going to go through here is just real briefly the, the few other cases that we worked on this year. And then, um, so in our April case, this one, this investigation was instigated by a human case. An individual did develop acute um, fibril illness, and in the investigation from the human side, we discovered that the individual owned and assisted um, uh, with um, goat delivery that resulted in abortion. Um, and that particular farm, it was a hobby farm that they had um, recently purchased new animals at a livestock market, and the animals were ELISA positive. And then in May, we had a meat goat herd. Um, they had added some new does to their herd. And after that, they had an 80% abortion rate in their older does. Um, and that was diagnosed positively as coxiella. In June, we had a high value show goat herd that was having abortions in their embryo transfer recipient herd. Um, and so we didn't find a positive source uh, where that came from. They had brought in some new animals in their recipient herd, but they had also brought in some cattle that were in an adjacent pen. Um, so we never really found where that came from. And then um, our, our last few cases of last year, in June we had another hobby farm um, that was having goat abortions, and this one actually did have a direct epi link to our initial February case. Um, they had purchased a goat from the premises in, in, that was positive in February, um, so that was nice to be able to tie that link together. In um, July, we had an exhibition, um, they actually were show goat um, exhibitors, and so Dr. House, if you want to talk about the last couple for the human cases. Yes, um, our July investigation was also instigated by a case of human illness. Um, the um, uh, individual um, was known to participate in animal exhibition and had recently purchased um, some new animals. Um, however, the animals themselves tested negative. Um, so for the July exhibition case, this would be a background case where we never actually found a definitive source. Um, the individual had been on three separate properties and also lived in an agricultural area. For our September investigation, that one actually started much earlier. We had an individual who had an onset of illness at the very end of May. Um, Q, fever Q fever was suspected and testing was negative on base both phase one and phase two. And the individual returned to healthcare several months later and got a convalescent taken that did show a um, confirmed increase. Um, and that particular um, investigation did involve a commercial dairy that had both, um, it's actually a very large facility that had both um, cattle and goats. And the particular individual um, had worked on the um, cattle dairy, but then had been assisting um, with um, delivery on the goat dairy. And the, the cattle and goats were not symptomatic. There were no known abortions. But the individual um, was very involved with the deliveries of the goats. And this um, slide just represents um, each of the highlighted counties is where one of those seven cases were. So you can see that they are not geographically um, close. Um, of the seven cases, there were um, uh, two that were related to each other. And so, there, so it was two, two, and then the other remaining three were completely individual, where we may not necessarily know the source. And then we have a slide of resources that we um, use to develop our um, response. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Our final presentation, multi-state outbreak of human salmonella infections linked to pet hedgehogs, is by Ms. Connor Hoff. Please begin when you're ready. With the Outbreak Response and Prevention Branch at CDC. And while I typically sit on the foodborne outbreak response team, I had the opportunity to work on this outbreak with my colleagues in the enteric zoonoses activity. Uh, so today I will be presenting on a recent and ongoing investigation into a multi-state outbreak of salmonella linked to pet hedgehogs. Salmonella causes an estimated 1.2 million illnesses annually in the United States and about 450 deaths. Symptoms typically include diarrhea, fever, and abdominal cramps, which usually last four to seven days, but can be longer. And people can get salmonella from consuming contaminated food, water, or contact with animals. Children under age five, adults over age 65, and people with weakened immune systems may be at greater risk for serious illness. 11% of non-typhoidal salmonella infections are attributable to contact with infected animals. Among enteric zoonoses, non-typhoidal salmonella infections result in the highest morbidity and mortality, making up 48% of hospitalizations and 62% of deaths, and children are disproportionately infected. So on December 20th of 2018, PulseNet, which is the National Molecular Subtyping Network for Enteric Disease Surveillance, reported a cluster of nine cases of Salmonella typhimurium from seven states that shared the same pulse steel gel electrophoresis, or PFGE, pattern. That same day, a few states began entering epi information for their cases into CEDRIC, which is the System for Enteric Disease Response, Investigation, and Coordination, which is the data management and visualization tool that we use by utilized to investigate these multi-state outbreaks in collaboration with state and regulatory partners. So with this preliminary epi information, we noticed that several cases reported contact with hedgehogs, which seemed a little bit unusual. And then we did a query for historical isolates that matched the same PFGE pattern and learned that there were several animal isolates also in our database that were from hedgehogs. So that gave us enough evidence to start narrowing our investigation in on potential hedgehog exposures. And over the next few weeks, we worked with our state partners to develop a hedgehog focus questionnaire and cases were interviewed to gather as much information as possible. As of March 27, 2019, there are 17 cases from 11 states included in this outbreak. Cases range in age from two to 95 years and 50% of cases are between the ages of 10 to 18 and 56% of cases are female. There have been two hospitalizations and no deaths reported. Of the 17 cases, 15 were able to be interviewed, and 13 of those 15 reported any type of exposure to hedgehogs. 10 cases reported direct hedgehog exposure, and three cases reported indirect exposure. So for example, they spent time with a friend or relative who had a hedgehog, but they did not necessarily interact with the hedgehog itself. So this is a map of the cases by state of residence. In the lightest green, uh, those cases just have one state each, and Minnesota and Missouri in blue have the most, with three cases each. Here we have an epi curve of cases by the reported and estimated dates of illness onset, which ranges from October 22nd of 2018 to March 1st of 2019. This timeline looks like our standard zoonotic outbreak with cases steadily being reported over a longer period of time, which differs from a point source outbreak, which typically involves a sharp increase in cases over a short period of time. On January 25th, a CDC investigation notice went live on the CDC website. This notice was recently updated on March 29th, reflecting new cases and information that was gathered over the course of the investigation. This is what the investigation notice looks like on the website with more information and advice as you scroll down the web page. The purpose of creating this investigation notice was to remind people that hedgehogs can be carriers of salmonella and to inform pet owners and breeders of steps that they can take to prevent illness. 
Part of our investigation was trying to figure out if there is a common source that hedgehogs were purchased from. Cases purchased hedgehogs from a mix of licensed and unlicensed breeders, pet shops, and one case purchased through their pet through Facebook. The only common breeder we identified was in Minnesota, where all three cases purchased their hedgehogs. After the first two cases were reported, Minnesota was actually able to obtain a list of people who had recently purchased their hedgehogs from this specific breeder and attempted to interview all of those people. And from those efforts, a third human case was identified as the person became ill a few days after they were interviewed by the Department of Health. And then we were able to trace back one step further for several of the hedgehogs, and it was interesting that a few of the breeders in the pet shop received at least a portion of their hedgehogs from suppliers in Michigan, although no one common supplier has been identified. So Minnesota Department of Health also supplied stool kits to test hedgehogs for the outbreak strain of salmonella, and eight of the 12 hedgehogs tested yielded the outbreak strain. Um, three of those hedgehogs belonged to two of the human cases in the cluster, and five of the positive hedgehogs belong to non-cases that purchase their hedgehogs from the same breeder. Um, and then an additional four hedgehogs that were tested, tested negative for salmonella. Um, notably, this is not the first multi-state outbreak of salmonella linked to hedgehogs. There was another outbreak in 2012 that was also salmonella type Miriam, but with a different PFGE pattern. That outbreak included 26 cases from 12 states, and 35% of ill persons were aged 10 or younger. Epi Laboratory and Traceback Evidence also linked this outbreak to pet hedgehogs purchased from multiple sources in different states. So if you're wondering where these critters come from, um, domesticated hedgehogs that are bred in the United States are African pygmy hedgehogs. And these are slightly smaller than their European counterparts, which are typically not bred in the United States. And these are solitary nocturnal animals that are native to tropical environments in Africa, and their diets in the wild consist of bugs, plants, and roots. And these conditions can be difficult to replicate for domestic animals, uh, which can make them challenging pets for some. Hedgehogs can be purchased from a variety of suppliers, including independent breeders, select pet stores that carry exotic animals, and online sales. Adoption or rehoming fees vary from around $70 to $250. Breeders must be licensed by the USDA Animal Plant Health Inspection Service if they have more than four breeding females. But no license is required for four or fewer breeding females. Hedgehogs are actually illegal to own in several states and cities in the United States, including California, Georgia, Hawaii, Pennsylvania, Washington, D.C., and New York City. And we did not have any cases reported from any of those places. Hedgehog sales are not tracked, but increasing popularity on sites like Instagram suggests ownership has increased in recent years. On the right, I have a screenshot from a New York Post article dating back to 2014 about the popularity of hedgehogs as pets. And to drive that point home, here are some photos of Instagram famous hedgehogs. Um, I will point out on the top left that Mr. Pokey has 1.3 million followers, so they're very popular. And there are many more popular accounts like these that provide very cute, uh, highly curated images of their pets in different settings. And on the lower left, you'll see an image of a hedgehog in a mug that's surrounded by candy. And CDC would not recommend keeping hedgehogs around areas where foods are prepared or stored. Um, so the CDC's Healthy Pets, Healthy People webpage provides information and advice on staying healthy around small pets. This information is available for download on the CDC website. This advice includes picking the right pet for your family, as children under 5, adults over age 65, and people with weakened immune systems may be at greater risk for serious illness from germs that pets can carry so hedgehogs may not be the best pets for people in these groups. Washing your hands after handling or feeding pets or cleaning their supplies is one of the most effective ways of preventing illness around pets. Other advice is to clean supplies and toys outside when possible, 
but if not, to clean in a bathtub or laundry sink away from where food is prepared and stored, and to play safely by not kissing or snuggling hedgehogs and not allowing them to roam free in your home, especially in the kitchen and areas around where food is prepared. So to wrap things up, uh, this is the second identified multi-state outbreak associated with pet hedgehogs involving 17 people from 11 different states. Traceback is not straightforward for hedgehogs and a common source was not identified for either outbreak, suggesting that this strain may be widespread in the hedgehog population. And while hedgehogs have become very popular household pets, they may not be the right pet for every household. And I would like to thank uh, everybody at CDC and our state health partners for contributing to this investigation and presentation. And we would be happy to field any questions. Thanks so much. At this time, we'd like to take questions for any of our presenters. Please call 1-800-593-8936 and enter participant passcode 9611836. Press star 1 and give the operator your name and affiliation. Please name the presenter or topic at the beginning of your question. Tim, before we check the phone line, we have a uh, question here in the room. I want to say who you are and what your, who your question's for. Um, hi, my name is Nathan. I'm an epi elective student here at the CDC. Um, my question uh, relates to the collaboration between the uh, Colorado uh, Department of Public Health and, and Agriculture. How was your response um, different than it, it normally would have been, I guess? Um, I know you mentioned the joint investigation um, report, I think, and, I, and I'm curious to know a little bit more about that as well, um, and, and what I guess, prompted you uh, to, to work together um, as opposed to independently? Um, Nathan, thanks for your question. This is Maggie from um, the Department of Ag, and I'll let Jennifer weigh in, in on this as well. Um, so fortunately, um, I, I've been in my position here for two years, and since I've been here, we've always worked very closely with the Department of Health, um, the Department of Public Health, CDPHE, and we do on a lot of different things. We do on rabies investigations, where CDA does the livestock side and public health does human and companion animal side. Um, I think that for Q fever, it probably helped us not double up our efforts, um, for one, and, and having public health out there on our site investigations, I think, gave our field VMOs a lot of good perspective as well. So um, Jennifer's been in her position much longer, so maybe she can talk a bit about um, what it was like maybe prior to this collaborative work. Um, and then my, my final point is if you have, if you're interested in seeing our joint EPI investigation form, you can certainly send me an email. It's just a, a fillable PDF that we created, and I'd be happy to share that. Okay, and this is Jennifer. Um, from the human perspective, Q fever has been reportable in Colorado, and often as part of the investigations, it does include the question, have you been around livestock and you know, specific things? Um, and you know, we can almost think that Q fever here, in, or the coxella, is practically ubiquitous in the Colorado envir environment. We have a a large population of sheep and goat farms throughout the state, um, at, along with cattle also. So we do believe it's fairly prevalent. Um, so past investigations we've looked at, you know, they, they had exposure, you know, check that mark, um, and, um, but we've not really gone the route of asking ag to investigate the farms. Um, in terms of coxialiosis in animals, it used to be that that had to be specifically requested by a veterinarian to get that testing done. Um, so the very first one in February, the veterinarian on that case had specifically requested that. After that investigation, our veterinary diagnostic lab actually added that pathogen to their abortion panel for small ruminants. 
which immediately um, increased our number of suspect cases on farms. Um, so, um, I mean, the reason we started collaborating was because of the, the raw milk situation entered a whole new um, perspective where there were potentially um, dozens of people exposed that don't work on a farm and may not know about animal diseases. And their providers may not know to look for animal diseases uh, because they may not share that they drink raw milk. Hey, thanks so much for those uh, responses. Tim, do we have any questions on the phone line? Yes, at this point we do have two questions, but before I get to those questions, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1. Please unmute your phone and record your name slowly and clearly when prompted. Your name is required to introduce your question uh, so that I can introduce you. But after you're introduced, please state your affiliation and who the question is for. To withdraw your request, please press star 2. One moment for the first question to queue up. And our first question comes from Warren Hess. Go ahead, Warren. Hi. Uh, so I'm with the American Veterinary Medical Association. I am just uh, have a question for the um, Salmonella Hedgehog presenter. I'm curious if any uh, data was captured as far as how recently these hedgehogs had been introduced into the homes. Hey, this is Connor. That's a great question. Um, so on the interviews, we did attempt to gather that information, but it was not available for everybody. Um, and patients, I would say, range from having their hedgehogs for around two years to some of them had just acquired their hedgehogs within the two weeks before becoming ill. So there was a variety, but yes, that was captured for um, most of the cases. Thank you. Our next question comes from Ronald Warner. Go ahead, Ronald. Yes, thank you. Uh, my question is for the uh, uh, Q fever in Colorado presentation. A very good presentation. Thank you for that. Uh, did your statistics for human infections over the past several years include the outbreak, I think it was in 2005, in a uh, horse boarding facility that had some goat abortions? Uh, yes, the slide that shows the cases from 1996 to present did include that particular outbreak. Thank you. And there are no further questions at this time. Okay, we'll just wait um, another minute or so, see if we have any more questions before we wrap up. Um, this is Jennifer House. I have a question about um, the hedgehogs. Um, and my question is, um, were the owners of the hedgehogs, could they potentially have been using um, like the same commercial diet to feed the hedgehogs? Hey, that's a great question. Uh, so we did ask about the hedgehog diet. Um, and we did not see any commonalities between hedgehogs as far as the same commercial brand. Uh, several, well, I guess many of the cases did report feeding their hedgehogs mealworms, uh, but those were also many different brands kind of across the spectrum as well. Thank you. Hey, Tim, do we have any one last question on the line? There are no questions at this time. If you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1. Give it one more minute. Hey, if there um, are there, well, just one last call. If there are any, if there's a final question, Tim. No more questions. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much um, to everyone who asked questions, and um, thanks again to all of today's speakers for their excellent presentations. Instructions for receiving free continuing education are available at cdc.gov/onehealth/zohu/continuingeducation. The course access code is 1Health2019.
to receive free CE for today's webcast, complete the evaluation at cdc.gov slash TCE online by May 6, 2019. A web-on-demand recording of today's call will be posted online by May 7, 2019 at cdc.gov slash onehealth slash sohu slash 2019 slash april dot html. Our next call will take place on Wednesday, May 1st at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Please send suggestions and questions to zohucall at cdc.gov. For more information and to subscribe to our email newsletter, please visit cdc.gov slash onehealth slash zohu. Thank you for your participation. This ends today's call.